John 10, 31 to 42. Let's read it together. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's. If you call them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world? You are blaspheming. Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him but he escaped from their hands. He went again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. The third time is a charm, they say in the world. The third time one tries to do something, there must be some luck to it. Today, is actually the third time that the Jews try to stone Jesus, as recorded by Apostle John. They fail miserably, though, as we Christians do not believe in luck, but in God's will. Let us study together how horribly the Jews fail at their third try of stoning Jesus, and how we Christians can learn to overcome our difficult situation of COVID-19. As Jesus also overcame his enemies and tough circumstances with God and his word, let the word of God that has been prepared for us today bless us, encourage us, and be victorious over our current events in the world. Verse 31, can we read it together? The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So why were the Jews trying to stone Jesus again the third time? If you were here with us last week or just read one verse before, you would know why. Pastor Jason, my associate pastor, he gave an amazing message. It's also recorded online. You should check that out if you have time afterwards. Verse 30 tells us, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Jesus just proclaimed that they are one. They're one in action. They're one in thought. They fully possess the divine nature the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're one God. Jesus just put himself in equal standing with God. This was not well accepted by the Jews of his time. So upon such statement, immediately the Jews picked up the stones again to stone him. How does Jesus fight such violence? As he always answers question with question, motives with question, attacks with question. In this act of violence from the Jews, Jesus again answers with the question. Look at verse 32. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Amazing, isn't he? How many times in our life do we act in such a way? Answer violence with a question. Answer attacks with question. Answer motives, other people's motive with question. Answer questions with question. Not just any question, but a godly question. Godly question evidenced by godly works. Are we also quick to fight violence with violence? Fight attacks with attacks? Fight others' motives with our own motives? Fight others' questions with our selfish answers? Our life is so filled with all of me, myself, and I. With Christ, it was completely opposite. He was always fixated on God and his works. His questions were solely for the glory of God and helping the sinner realize their place before God. So in Jesus questioning to the Jews, he helps them remember all the good works that he did. Erga kala in Greek, which means 
beautiful works in our passage. They were beautiful and good because these works were straight from the Father. And these works went straight through Jesus to bless men and women. The works of Jesus were the direct proof that he was carrying out God's mission. John 5.36, if you want to turn there with me, you may. John 5.36 says, For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. If I am doing God's works, aren't I from God? Think of it this way. Many of you have worked or currently work for a company, yes? I pray that you have not been laid off in this situation. It's very difficult, I know. But when you do go into work, don't you do what they tell you to do? If you don't, what would happen to you? Be fired, of course. If you do the work, what happens? You will continually be hired and be paid by the company. You would be considered as a team member of that company because what you do and how you work represents your company. You belong to that company. You are from that company. Very simple, isn't it? Our Jesus 2,000 years ago was doing good works from heavenly company. Heavenly Father gave his son a job to carry out, and Jesus carried out many of them perfectly and miraculously. With such proof, Jesus questioned the Jews, for which of them are you going to stone me? Jesus' words were in perfect harmony with this good and beautiful works. We know that Jews definitely didn't like Jesus for all the good works he did prior. When Jesus made the cripple carry his mat on the Sabbath and walk, when Jesus put mud on the eyes of the blind man on the Sabbath, they don't like that. But to the Jews, Jesus' words were far worse than his beautiful actions. Actions were bad enough because Jesus was breaking their sabbatical law. But when Jesus followed his action with calling God as his own father, Abba Father, Appa, Daddy, putting him on the equal standing with God, do you understand? We have 16 hamsters at home because we have a dad and a mom and they have babies. Hamster... I don't speak hamster, but if they say, daddy, mommy, what makes that hamster? A hamster, right? It makes the son of a hamster a hamster. You understand? Jesus was calling God, daddy. Saying, I'm God. John 5, 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, to stone him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Second time they take out a stone against Jesus is when Jesus claimed himself to be, I am. The title given to Yahweh, Y-W-H, Y-H-W-H. God of Israel alone, Yahweh. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is a title given to God. It's his name. Actions were miraculous and amazing. Yet to them, the actions were despicable, for they were done on the Sabbath. Saving people are not allowed on Sabbath? Is that crazy or what? You see someone dying on Sunday, but you're going to church. Will you not save that person? It's ridiculous. What a horrible argument. Yet what really got them over the top was when Jesus called God his own father. When Jesus called himself, I am Yahweh. Name given to God of the Old Testament, the Israelites. And from today's passage, when Jesus said, Father and I are one. We are in perfect unity. We are one God. However, did you know that there are still people in the world who makes ridiculous claim that Jesus never claimed to be God? 
If Jesus never claimed to be God, why would the Jews be so angry? So angry enough that they would try to stone a man who never sinned, but only did good works. Look at verse 33 with me. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. The Jews completely understood what Jesus was claiming to be. Jesus claimed to be God. There's nothing else, okay? That was the main reason why the Jews wanted to stone him. So if you have a friend or family member who thinks that Jesus never claimed to be God, show him this verse, John 10, 33, and the three instances that Jews wanted to stone Jesus. Absolutely clear proof that this is who Jesus claimed to be and that the Jews exactly knew what Jesus was saying. For the sin of blasphemy, according to Old Testament, the Jews had to carry out stoning. However, there was a legal process that they had to go through. The Jews did not care for that portion of the law, though. Furthermore, the Jews are, are under Roman jurisdiction, Roman government at that time, and the Romans did not allow capital punishment, killing someone without their supervision, without their allowance. So in every way, the Jews were in the wrong. They did not follow their own Old Testament law spiritually. They did not follow the Roman law politically. Now Jesus goes even further to prove them wrong theologically. This is really important. I want you to get this, okay? Look at verse 34 to 36. This is really important. 34 to 36. Turn with me there. If you can read with me, let's read it together. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If you call them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? These three verses, you may have to read on your own a few more times to really grasp what Jesus is trying to say. I myself had to spend quite a long time to fully understand the authorial intent behind this question against Jews' attack and accusation. Did you notice that, though, in these three verses? Question again. Using what this time? Last time was questioning with the basis on works of God, right? Works of God. Now, this time was questioning with the basis on words of God from Old Testament. Today's message is titled, Works of God and Words of God. And we see how Jesus is using them amazingly. Is it not written in your law? Referring to the whole Bible, the Old Testament up to that point, Jesus specifically quotes Psalm 82, verse 6. All right? If some of you can put that up on Facebook chat, I would really appreciate that. This is a really good verse for you to think about, to read upon. If you have a Bible, go back there, Psalm 82, verse 6. Let's read it together. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Who are these gods? Sons of the Most High, referenced in Psalm 82. They are the unjust judges that God cursed against in the Old Testament. God chose to use the word Elohim, name that could be used for God, fake gods or judges. What was Jesus trying to prove? He was demonstrating to the Jews that the word God can be used other times than just for God most high. So if God can even call people as gods or sons of the Most High, how can the Jews possibly deny Jesus' claim that he is the true, legitimate Son of God? There was no way that the Jews could object this truth. Jesus was basing his argument of deity on this one word, Elohim. At this time, it was used for judges, unjust judges, but at other times it was used for God, the Most High, and other times it was used for false idols. 
But Psalm 82, verse 2, is using for mere men. Men, you and I, who were given such title as they ruled over the people of God. Then, what is so wrong about Jesus claiming to be God? Elohim. When unjust judges were called with the same name in the Bible, what is so wrong about Jesus claiming to be the Son of God? When unjust judges were given the title Sons of the Most High, Jesus was so serious of this one word that he even goes to emphasize in the Bible, verse 35, Scripture cannot be broken. Jews, don't you know and believe in the Old Testament? The word Elohim can be used towards a man. This is what the Bible teaches. The scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be nullified. It is infallible. It is without error. Are you accusing me that I cannot be called the son of God? Let me base my whole argument on one word in the minor psalm of Asaph, Psalm 82. How can I do this? Because that is the authority of scripture. One verse, one sentence, one word, one stroke, one dot. If it is written in the word, they are absolutely accurately true for anyone and everyone to believe in. And that's what Jesus was saying. Matthew 5, 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all it is accomplished. This was life of Jesus, wholly guided by two things, word of God and works of God. Word of God and works of God. Jesus was either preaching the word of God or doing the works of God. Difficult times, up and down, all the situation, Jesus was doing the works of God. Look at verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. What a lifestyle. Now evidence, Jesus' heavenly origin of God's heavenly mission. So the Jews got best of both worlds from Jesus. They got a single word, Bible study from Jesus, single word, right? Elohim. And they saw all the miraculous works of God through Jesus. However, words or works, it did not matter to the Jews. Their heart was completely closed off. Verse 38, let's read it together. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. They would not believe in Jesus' words and his Bible study on how Old Testament is connected to him. They also could not believe in his works that were blessed by his father. Not only did Jesus teach with authority, but Jesus did what his father could only do. Jesus gave new set of eyes to a blind man. Jesus healed the legs of a crippled man. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from his deathbed. Jesus walked on water. Jesus fed 5,000 men. Who can do such works but God alone? How could they not consider that these acts were not done by God himself? Jesus verbalizes this oneness again, plain and simple for the Jews. Know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. The Father in me, I am the Father. The indwelling relationship is the essence of Trinity that true Christianity teaches. There are many Christian groups out there who may not be 100% aligned theologically with our church and what we believe, but we could work with them as long as the core issues are aligned biblically, right? A hill to die on. Core issues for a real follower of Jesus Christ. I know many churches have this. Our churches have it too. First is gospel. We cannot comprom com compromise the gospel, right? Christ is the only way to save a sinner. If another church does not teach this or believe this, I would not be able to work with them. Second, Bible. We cannot comprom 
compromise the word of God. We cannot compromise this. We have to preach the truth of Christ day in and day out. And third, you know, there could be others too. Trinity is one of them. I cannot compromise our faith, my faith, on who our God is. I don't think you could consider yourself a Christian if you compromise any of these three. Agree? The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Father indwells the Son and the Spirit. The Son indwells the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit indwells the Father and the Son. From beginning of time, from Genesis, what is recorded, and even from before, the Holy Trinity was, is, and will forever be in perfect harmony and fellowship. Yet we have been given, LA One Church and Christians, everybody that's on Facebook right now, everybody here, if you believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we've been given this tremendous blessing and opportunity to be part of this household. No one has ever seen God, but the Son has made him known to us. No one has ever seen God, but if you saw the Son, it is as if you have seen the Father. We have not met God, but if we believe in the Son, the Spirit indwells us. And the same Holy Spirit guarantees our eternal fellowship with God. Holy Trinity has perfectly worked together to give us the gospel message. Holy Trinity is perfectly working today in penetrating the hearts of many with the gospel. Holy Trinity has perfectly worked together to compile us the canon, the whole Bible. Holy Trinity is perfectly working out the word of God in our lives to sanctify us. Not believing in the Holy Trinity completely robs the core essence of Christianity. It's like having a peanut butter sandwich without peanut butter. Can you imagine that? Hey, you want to eat peanut butter sandwich? But there's no peanut butter inside. It's just bread, loaf of bread. It's like having a steak salad without steak. Hey, here's a steak salad without steak. It's like eating a clam chowder without a clam. You get the point, right? If you do not believe that God is spirit, spirit is God, and Christ is God, you won't be able to understand Christianity in its fullest sense. What do you think the Jews felt about this teaching? Completely ignorant. Completely opposed to the works of God. Completely against the one sent by God. So they once again continue their pointless attempt of capturing Jesus. Verse 39. Let's read it together. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Why is it pointless? Because now is not the time. God is in full control of when Jesus is going to be captured, tried, and crucified. So Jesus escapes. That in itself is a miracle, isn't it? Every time we read in the Bible, people want to capture him, but he gets away. Just like that. Where Jesus goes, a man's name from that town is mentioned. Actually, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, one whom I truly look up to as a role model. Verse 40 to 41, let's read it together. He went again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. John the Baptist who is long gone in the grave, has an everlasting effect because he resembled Christ so closely while he was living. Jesus' life was all about two things, words of God and works of God. Words of God and works of God. Guess what John's life was all about? Words of God and works of God. Do you know what else is so remarkable about John the Baptist? He is one figure in the New Testament who has no record of any miraculous signs. Did you know that? John the Baptist is the only guy in the New Testament who is really famous with all the apostles, all, you know, like Jesus, like Peter, like Paul, guy with no record of any miraculous signs. Yet the Bible considers John as the greatest man ever born of a woman up to that point. How so? The verses here really doesn't say much about John, does it? But this one single sentence speaks volume of a man who has been martyred for some time now. John did no sign, 
but everything that John said about this man was true. John did no sign, no miracles, no healing, no gift of tongues, no resurrecting. John showed no power like Elijah. He did not stop the rain. He did not bring fire from heaven. He did not raise the dead. But he spoke God's word to directly to everyone's attention to, and directed everyone to Jesus as a savior and Lord of the world. John could not even see Jesus crucified like the Israelites did. John could not even see Jesus take all the sins of the world and die on the cross. John could not even see Jesus glorified like the disciples did. But he had tremendous faith in God's word and God's works. That Christ will do what God sent him to do. And that was more than enough for John. So he preached the truth of Christ and was martyred for it. He was considered the greatest because he got to be part of Jesus' prophecy. He got to personally see and proclaim the promises of the Old Testament. Yet Bible promises the believers, you and I, afterwards, will be even greater. Because you and I get to fully experience the atoning work of Christ. Amen? Do you believe that you and I have experienced the atoning work of Christ? That our sins are forgiven? All of our sins, past, present, and future, you and I, we've been forgiven because Christ died once and for all 2,000 years ago. That's what you and I have. But many people in the world, such work of Christ is not enough. They continue to seek for a sign. Even Christians who attend churches, desire signs after signs, shows after shows, Miracles after miracles. So they church up, go to seminars after seminars, meet pastors, another pastor, another pastor. What does this pastor have for me? What does this pastor have for me? And they just keep church hopping. They just go everywhere because they want signs, 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 signs. Miracles, miracles, miracles. Cool things, cool things, cool things. Show, 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 show. Seminar, seminar, seminar. Conferences, conferences. Is that what we need to be a Christian? Is the living word of God Christ himself enough? Is the work of God, what Christ did on the cross, enough? Isn't he more than enough? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is also spoken by John the Baptist. John 3.30, this is a great verse. You need to know this. John 3.30, please turn there. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. Probably moved by the Spirit of God, Apostle John, author of this gospel, progressively talks less of John every time he is mentioned. In the beginning, there is a lot of John. Towards the end, there is little. And towards the end, as you see my hand out of the screen, there's none of John the Baptist. How true were the words of John? He must increase, but I must decrease. Just as Apostle John's description of John the Baptist decreased, description of Jesus increased. Ministry of John decreased, ministry of Jesus increased. Less of me and more of you. John clearly understood it. However, in our life, we want to show up. We want to make our message about me. We want to make our work about me. We want to make our relationship, our friendship, people that we meet about me. We want to make our family about me. Everything that we do, breathe, work, and play is about me. How selfish are we, church? John was so humble, wasn't he? Few disciples he had. When Jesus came, he sent them away to Jesus. Because John knew it wasn't about him. It wasn't about all the glorious signs. It was about who Jesus is and what he was going to do. Then he quietly passed the baton so Jesus may receive all the glory. Jesus started doing all the work that John said he was going to do. 
Jesus started to prove all that John said he is. So though John was dead, his words lived on. Though John no longer spoke a word, verbal words, his ministry was powerful, effective, and eternal. How so? Because he spoke the words of God and works of God. People believed in Jesus. Look at verse 42 of our passage, last verse. And many believed in him there. And many believed in him there. Church, we're in tough times of uncharted waters. Unprecedented time in world history. What will you do? How will you be remembered? I pray that it will be the life that John and Jesus lived. Speak the word of God and works of God. Do the word of God and works of God. Look for opportunities. Pray for spiritual openings. Share the word of God and works of God. And just maybe by God's grace and mercy, we may be like John the Baptist. Your words may live on unto eternity. Your words may live on unto eternity. Many may believe in Christ through you. Right now is perfect timing. Today is the day of salvation. I was able to share the gospel to a brother because he is fearful of COVID-19. People are worried about their family, about their community, about their situation, about their job security, about their own physical life. If this is not the perfect timing for us to share the gospel, when is? Today is the day of salvation. You may not be able to meet them physically, but you may be able to meet them through the web, through the phone. Today is the day of salvation. You have to understand, though, that the window is limited. The window is limited. So coronavirus or not, them listening or not listening, closing their ears, believing or not believing, closing their heart, accepting or rejecting, let our light be like John and Jesus. Preach the truth day in and day out and leave the results to God. Consider this time as a perfect opportunity for you to share the gospel because the time is running out. You know, I heard of a Christian who started a Bible reading club. They're reading about 10 chapters a day right now. 10 chapters a day because you have so much time. You're staying home. You're not driving to work. You have to work at home or you have to do social distancing. So you're staying so this Christian is reading 10 chapters a day Bible challenge with other friends. I heard of another Christian who is copying the Bible right now with a friend. So they copy one chapter a day. They're starting Genesis right now. This Christian, they're copying one chapter in Genesis. They write it down, and then they take a photo of it, and then they share it to each other. They message one another and say, did you write Genesis 1 today? Did you write Genesis 2 today? And they're encouraging one another that way. Brothers and sisters, time is running out. People are calling me. People are asking me, can you share the gospel to my friend? Can you share the gospel to me? Brothers and sisters, we have to preach the truth day in and day out. Just as John the Baptist did, just as Jesus did, we share the word of God, the works of God, and leave the result to God. Please remember, do the words of God works of God and leave the result to God because time is running out. Let us pray. God says his son.